the Indian media are politically free and imprisoned by profit. Politically, they can be extraordinarily free and you can do things in the media there that you cannot do in the United States, that you certainly cannot do in many of our neighboring countries. You get away with a lot. Again, partly because of the anarchistic nature of Indian democracy, it's very hard to do anything to you for a very long time. But uh, simply, I mean, I begin with that again. The Indian media are politically free, imprisoned by profit. This end of September, September 20th exactly, I, I completed 33 years in journalism. I've loved every moment of it and I never wanted to be a journalist or a reporter anywhere else. India that way is a journalist paradise, a reporter's you know, paradise. You, you, you don't look for stories, they look for you. From the very first day, I mean, it, it, I have really loved this profession, often though the things we do are, 33 years ago I walked into the United News of India and I loved it from the first day. It's a news agency, our second largest news agency. My introduction to it was to walk in from the JNU campus to the United News of India, which I had joined, and to attend my first shift, I walked in to find two veteran journalists punching each other out in the canteen. <laughs> I watched another two veteran journalists release the air from the tires of a third in order to prevent him from getting to a story on time. <laughs> I watched yet another veteran journalist pick the STD lock. In those days it was all analog telephones, okay, not digital picked the STD lock on the general manager's phone while the general manager was away and chat four hours with his girlfriend in Timbuktu or wherever. <laughs> and I watched yet another veteran who I was told was a dissident and angry because the management had given him bad shifts. So he was, uh, his form of protest, his protest took the form of uh, playing chess which seemed to me a very innocuous protest until I discovered that he was playing chess on the telex machine with somebody in New York. <laughs> yes. I knew I had come to the right place. <laughs> <laughs> to steal a phrase from Mark Twain, I had found my true vocation. There was something prescient about that punch out of those two correspondents. When I look back now, I think it was prophetic. Uh, one, of course, both were heavily fueled by, they were driven by spirits which I later learned were brewed on the premises of the news agency in the backyard. Okay? We had our own illicit history. And, but the more important and prophetic thing about that fight was who won. The business correspondent beat the living daylights out of the labor report. You know? and, and so the world was to unfold over the next 30 years. Right? Business beat the hell out of labor. Um, what are the, I mean worldwide I would say, the Indian media, much of its modeling in the last 20-30 years, aspiration in India, has been to quite some extent, an imitation of corporate media in the United States. You even have anchors who model their styles. You've got a Bill O'Reilly, Bill O'Reilly, uh, you know, clone, or attempts to be anyway. I mean, he actually succeeds in being as obnoxious. <laughs> and, uh, so you have that modeling. In, in fact, most of what happened in the U.S. media 20, 30 years ago has been happening in India in the last. 10, 20 years, and the three crazy features you could, you know, you could look at as being uh, as determining what's happening in this place. One, I think worldwide, the media of our times are characterized by the growing disconnect between mass media on the one hand and mass reality on the other. That distance grows greater and greater and greater. And I will show that to you not just in content, but in the structure of media. 
who is shut out, what are the beats we cover, what are the beats that used to exist, all of which have disappeared in the last 20 years. <coughs> there is no longer a labor correspondent to beta. That's extinct. The labor reporter is extinct. Labor reporting is now covered by the guy tied with the title, uh, by the business reporter holding additional portfolio of industrial relations, which means he talks to the PRO of the corporate and writes his labor reporting, does his labor reporting. So one is this growing disconnect between mass media and mass reality. The second, and in the case of the Indian media, which whose traditions are very, very different from um, Western traditions in many ways, is there is the material and other is the incredible pace of corporatization in the last 10 12 years and as a result of which I, I believe there is a serious shift in the moral universe of the media this was a very different media you know before I came here Laura was asking me about alternative media in India Right through the colonial period, our mainstream, what is our mainstream media was the alternative media. See? Meaning we had a giant alternative media. For two decades after that, the mainstream media still reflect those values and then these begin to, then these begin to erode uh, dramatically. Here's a paradox in a media that in, in 2016 will be 200 years old. Many claim it is already 200 years old, but that's really by looking at British-owned newspapers. <coughs> the first Indian-owned publication that we remember was established in 1816 by Raja Ram Roy, and it was in Persian, because then a very popular language in the elite, Miratul Akbar. It was a newspaper founded by Raja Ram Roy, who was a very great social reformer and a scholar and the genius and the founder of many things, including Brahma Samaj. If we look at it, the present phase is a, is a short phase in a rather distinguished history of almost 200 years. Not entirely, not unblemished, in fact, full of blemishes, but still a distinguished history in the way that a tiny, new, tiny media did some extraordinary things. And that brings me to yet another feature, apart from the three I listed out for you. What I call the great paradox of the Indian media. In, 18, in 1893, the Indian media was so, the Indian press was so tiny, so feeble, but it could put an empire on the mat. There's a book which I strongly recommend the history types to look at. It's called A Tour Through the Famine Districts of India by the Reuters Special Correspondent, SHM Meriwether. And it makes actually heavy weather of the whole thing, but <laughs> SHM Meriwether uh, wrote this book. The introduction tells you everything about the book. He was a Reuters Special Correspondent. Reuters, of course, independent organization not dictated to by governments and all that stuff. So he says that his trip to India, to the famine districts, came about as a, as a result of a request of Her Majesty's government, because they're an independent organization. Her Majesty had to request them. So uh, a request from Her Majesty's government to visit and highlight the good works our administrators are doing in the famine-stricken districts of India in reply to the noisy riffraff of the nationalist press. It was amazing to me that in 1893, a tiny press could put an empire on the defensive that the, Her Majesty's government felt compelled to request Reuters to counter the propaganda. By the way, that was also the time when Bal Gagadhar Tilak was writing. When he actually decided to collaborate with a very great Indian social reformer and well, not so much a social reformer as a political agitationist. And he decided to suspend his hostilities with the British because the famine was so bad he decided to work with them on the famine relief thing. 
and you will find another comment on the Indian elite in Bal Gangadhar Tilak's writing at the time because that same levels of inequality are returning. Much of Bal Gangadhar Tilak, there is a scathing critique of the Indian elite who sat in their gymkhanas while people died of famine on the streets outside the gymkhana. It, it's very, there's something of deja vu about, about what's going on in, in, the, in the situation. But the Tilaks, the, a lot of other people, may, many of them, um, nascent socialist and, left, and other leftist trends, could put that empire on the defensive. And, and I was trying to think, in many weather's time, how many Indian publications were there that had a, a print order of more than a thousand? How many of them did? Again, you, when you come later to the period of Gandhi, Gandhi's main journals did not have very high, relatively high print orders of the time, but there are also such things as literacy rates and you know, distribution and stuff. Yet, when he wrote something, the moral authority was such that every other newspaper and magazine reproduced it in one way or the other, either to discredit and attack him, or to support him, or to discuss it. Here's the paradox. In that period, in, the, in that period, in the early period of the Indian media, especially especially that 18, you know, 1860s to 1920s period, uh, here the paradox is a tiny Indian press, a tiny Indian press played such a gigantic social role. Today, a gigantic Indian media press, Indian media, plays the narrowest social role. That's mm. the paradox. This is the fastest growing media. You've heard all that bullshit. Okay. We, we, we are the greatest. Simple. I mean, end of that, that, that part of it is summarized. High, highly profit making. You know, uh, newspapers in USA are collapsing, but our circulations are increasing. Partly that's because broadband penetration in India is zilch. When that begins to happen, as it has begun to happen, when that begins to improve, a lot of the miracle circulations will taper off and, you know. So, uh, this, is that, this is that central paradox between what, between the pre-independence of the early 20th century, late 19th century media, and now. In 2012, you have a very frank statement by the owner of the biggest English language newspaper in the world, one of the family that owns it, the Times of India. Believe me, that's a giant circulation. Bigger than any other English newspaper in the, country, in the world by far. And he has given this interview in the New Yorker to Ken Auletta, October 8, 2012 in which one of, the, one of the owning members of the family, Vineet Jain, managing director and many other field marshals, rhythms and all that stuff in the organization, tells Oleta, this is the biggest newspaper group, the biggest in revenue, biggest in circulation for an English newspaper anywhere. We are not in the newspaper business, we are in the advertising business. <laughs> On record, we are not in the newspaper business. We are in the advert. We are we are in the advertising business. We are not in the business of news. That is his exact. Those are his exact words. But it's not just into the advertising business they're into. They're into a lot of other businesses. The landscape of media has been transformed by corporatization. If you look at the other kinds of businesses that they're into, if you look at, say, the non-media business linkages and the investments of the media, they're into an astonishing, astonishing array. If I just even give you a sampling of, of what they're into, I'll, I'll come to that when we get to the beats and stuff, but they are just unbelievably extended and embedded in, yeah, in for sample. This is just a sample. I had started to write it out last night. 
and I thought I would be here another week doing it. So I just end with about 100, okay? <laughs> Aviation, agriculture, advertising, agricultural finance, agricultural missionary, trading, within trading about 30 categories. So trading, cement, then manufacture, cement, jute, shipping, steel, aluminium, casting, chemicals, cotton, agrochemicals, sugarcane, rubber, tea, coffee, tires, dairy, real estate. In fact, I've always felt in the last, if, I, if you ask me to sum up the last 10 years or 15 years, it's, it's the near disappearance, it's very hard to tell the fourth estate from real estate. It's one of the main, it's one of the main areas of operation of the media. Uh, real estate, plantations, automobiles, textiles, man-made fibers, excise contractors, that includes liquor and alcohol. Many media groups are big into it. Uh, ink factories, I didn't know they still existed, but uh, banks, yeah, banks, power sector, educational, education sweatshops. We have education barons who are owners of some of the biggest newspapers in the country. Hardware, government contracts, software, gypsum mining, coal mining, books, music, travel agencies, chit funds. Chit funds are Ponzi schemes? Yeah, that's what chit funds. We have media big into this, big time into this. One of those major organizations collapsed in Bengal earlier this year, leaving 800 journalists without jobs. Uh, processed foods, electronics, transports, um, cricket, IPL, in Indian Premier League, owner of an IPL team, in fact, at least one newspaper. Um, this could go on. Because you see, I've, I've been going alphabetically and I believe each D or something. Like that. So you, this is, now they are, they have got their finger in every pie, in everything. This year, the richest man in India and one of the 10 richest men in the world, Mukesh Ambani, made a buy that made him probably the biggest media owner in India. He bought Network 18. Absolutely nobody knows exactly how big Network 18 is. Most of us realize, think of Network 18 as being the parent body or owner of CNN IBM. But Network 18 owns other, it owns the biggest business TV channel, CNBC 18. It owns Lokmat IBM, IBM 7. It owns, a, it, and not, a, not most Indians don't know, that the biggest regional network of, the biggest network of regional television, which has audiences in more millions than you can count, is known as Inaru TV. Except, did you know this Shankar? Except for the Telugu channel of Inadu, all the other Inadu channels are now owned by Mukesh Ambani. He got Network 18 to buy them and then he bought Network 18. So that the negotiations would not be, you know, if he was present, the price would go up. So in Network 18, Network 18 is sitting on about 30 channels and, and hundreds of niche magazines and pamphlets and whatever, plus into portals and you name it. That is owned by one of the biggest corporations, by the biggest corporation in India, by a guy who's in the top 10 richest people in the world. He owns Network 18, he owns my friend Rajdeep. <laughs> and this is giving him a hard time. Uh, so that's just one. Here's another way of looking at it. I have fun doing this. Get on to the net, you can do that from here. Take the major news, news groups, those which actually put up some website, and look at who is the board of directors of our major newspapers. Try very hard to find a journalist in it. Mm -hmm. The media organizations boards have virtually no journalists in it except the owning family, a representative whose grandfather may have been a distinguished journalist in 1930. 
The biggest newspaper in India is not in English. It is the Dainik Jagran. It's got 34 editions and they aim for 100. And they're in negotiations with Mr. Mukesh Ambani who wants to buy them. This is franchisee journalism, okay? It's McDonald's journalism. Anyone can start in it. You want to start an um, edition of Dainik Jagran in Tirunal Valley, Tamil Nadu, you can. You have to pay the Dainik Jagran so much each year. And they'll supply you with a certain number of pages of material. And you can, you can indulge your fantasies on the remaining two, three pages that you put up in Tirunal Valley. Assuming that people read in the Tirunal Valley. But they will get into Tamil also. So it's a matter of time. So you have magazine. The, ma the magazine world, by the way, is already steeply in decline. That is affected by the net much more than anyone else because you're coming out with something. You call it India today. It's about India the previous fort fortnight. And you know, that, that's going down very fast. Down in the magazine world is going down very fast. On the boards. Who are on the boards? Dainik Jagran is a Hindi newspaper. I locate at least three directors who it's unlikely know a single word of Hindi. Because one of them is the South Asia head of McDonald's. Okay. But I think he has stepped down in the last change. But the South Asia head of McDonald's was of Dainik Jagran. Also on the board of Dainik Jagran was a representative of General Electric. Also on the board of Dainik Jagran was what some O'Reilly who is from WAN, you know, the World Association of Newspapers. Gavin O'Reilly from the world. I'm sure Gavin, you know, the chances of Gavin knowing Hindi are <laughs> probably, well, maybe higher than the chances of his knowing Gaelic, but, <laughs> but <laughs> unlikely nonetheless. And then two of the Two of the top real estate companies in Delhi are on the board. The board changes now and then according to the needs of the owners. And then you have uh, the top, the top tax lawyer from Uttar Pradesh and the, the top chartered accountant of that place. And that is the board of directors. And you can look at this on the boards of one newspaper after the others. There are bankers. In fact, the frame of analysis that I, I, was, I, I used for this was pretty similar to what Ben Bagdikian did in this country in 1983. It remains the greatest book on that subject. The Media Monopoly, which has come out in seven editions. The last being the new Media Monopoly, where he's included the internet companies as well, where he's in, included net-based media. Bagdikian, as you know, was the national editor of the Washington Post at a time when newspapers did investigations and broke the Pentagon Papers story and everything else, and was later professor and dean at Berkeley. Looking at, looking at the interlocking between banks, armament companies, newspapers, media, Bagdikian put it in one line. He said, it's an incredible maze of Corporate incest within corporate incest. So the directors of banks and multinational armaments companies would be on the board of newspapers, or the board of directors of newspapers. And a member of the board of the, and the, the newspaper guys would be represented on the banks or on the armament companies board. So that's what he meant by corporate incest within corporate incest. A very similar situation almost identical in some respects, is unfolding. Of course, there are going to be changes and appearances of difference because it is India and it's a different country. But the principle is the same. The corporate hijack, first of the media agenda, then of the media itself. Okay? So that's another feature of the media. When I join, let's look at what it is we cover, who we cover, what we do, who are the, who are the reporters. We've looked at the owners. Actually, we haven't, but I think that's enough of the owners. Uh, they are corporations. And it's some of the fastest corporatization is taking place. It's having devastating implications for journalists' jobs. I count 1,700 jobs lost this year alone in violation of the Working Journalists Act. CNN IBL, Mr. Mukesh, Mukesh Nambani took it over. 
officially admits to throwing out 325 employees, press release, my count is 480. Okay, I count the camera persons and the technicians as well, they're human beings too. And they are media persons too. They, they're all thrown out. What are the what are the beats we cover? What are the things we do? When I joined, there was a labor correspondent. There was an agriculture correspondent. There were all sorts of correspondents. Today, the country with the largest number of poor people, absolute poor in the world, does not have a single full-time correspondent on the poverty beat. Not one. The country with the first or the second largest housing problem in the world does not have a single correspondent whose whole time beat is on housing, homelessness or such issues. The same newspapers have full time correspondents on cricket, on cinema, on, on, on gossip columns, on eating out. But the last, I'm just knocking them because purely out of jealousy. It's always the, it's always the one I wanted, the eating out one. But, uh, but uh, we have full time guys for eating out, okay? And it's very demoralizing to me. But we do not have a single full time correspondent on poverty, homelessness, and housing, or even on agriculture. What we call agriculture correspondents today are guys who cover the agriculture ministry. They don't do field reporting of agriculture. You know, from the sowing to the, maybe from the credit season to the sowing, to the spraying, to the harvest, to the marketing, that they don't come. That local newspapers may still have someone who in a given season will do it, but no national publication or channel has a full-time agriculture correspondent. I'm the closest that comes to it, but I do many things other than cover agriculture. So it would not be right to point to me as an example of that then we do not have a single labor correspondent. It's extinct. As I said, that's been merged into industrial relations. In a country with a giant labor force, 93% of the workforce in the unorganized sector. You need reporting. But we do not have a single full-time, in the major dailies, in the major channels, you do not have a single full-time labor correspondent. Just to give you an idea how important that issue of covering employment is. On what we call our registered employment exchanges, which are mostly an urban and semi-urban phenomenon and do not capture unemployment really, but the employment exchange figure of job seekers in India is close to 40 million. Okay. That's a volatile, giant section that desperately needs to be reported. To give you an idea of how much is 40 million, if we place those 40 million in a single queue, it's three and a half times the size of the Indian coastline, which is 6,278 kilometers or something like that, the mainland coastline, not counting the islands. But we do not have a correspondent for that. In 2006, some of you here have seen Nero's case. 2006 was one of the worst years of farmers' suicides in India, one of the worst years. And the character, the, the event that happened in one particular week captured who the Indian media are, in which direction they're going, how they're, as I said, a shift in the moral universe of the media. I was at that time in Vitarba, the epicenter of the farm suicide. And I decided to count how many of us, Vidarbha is not a small place, it's twice the size of Kerala, it's bigger than Punjab, just Vidarbha region. The, the six districts where the trouble is, is bigger than the state of Punjab. That's how large it is. Maharashtra is after all a state of 112 million people. So you have, uh, when the, I wanted to see how many journalists from outside Vidarbha were there. We found six, including myself and the other guy doing the counting, who were there for at least a week. Why did I set the criteria of a week? Because the Lakme Fashion Week was going on in Mumbai. One hour's flight away. Lakme Fashion Week. The number of journalists covering 
the greatest wave of human suicides in history. Six. Out of that six, two were there a week only because they had missed their flight. So really four intended to be there the whole week. But let's say six. At the Lakme Fashion Week in Mumbai, one hour's flight away, 512 accredited correspondents covered the Fashion Week all seven days. Apart from the 512 accredited correspondents who covered it all seven days, another 100 covered it on daily passes. So six journalists to cover the greatest wave of suicides in the world, 600 covering Lakme Fashion Week. That's it. Subsequently, I'm going to, you know, make two more points and end it there so that we can just open this up. But subsequently, two more. I mean, there were subsequently, as the corporatization grew, the media also finds itself embroiled in giant scandals and scams, including Colgate, including 2G, including the Radia tapes, which we can talk about. The media have been not in the scams as investigative reporters. They've been there as criminals. That, that has also happened to the media. And two points which I want to leave you with. One is, as, as the corporatization grew, the linkage of the media to the stock markets became so profound, they took the most profit-making media in the world took a bath in 2008 September when the twits in Wall Street blew it for everybody. For the first time, the highest profit-making media in the world in rate of profit, not in quantum, lost, went into the red. But there's another thing that comes out of that. There's a very important thing that comes out of that. When the media's links, do you know, during that whole period, the newspapers and channels kept insisting that India was untouched by Wall Street's collapse. You know why they had to do that? Because they owned so many millions of shares that would tank. They had to heat and keep the, they had to keep the stock market afloat because of three deadly devices they had got themselves into. One, an in pioneering Indian racket called private treaties. You can see this for yourself. There are websites, Times of India, privatetreaties.com. Now you might think that a treaty is something signed between two nations. No, it's not. A treaty is, a private treaty is signed between a middle to large corporation and a newspaper. Shankar is the medium sized corporation and the large newspaper. The moment he signs a treaty with me, Times of India has some 240, 250 such clients, as far as I know. They, they, they even have a website, you can find some of the clients. The moment Shankar signs that agreement with me, I get to own 10% of the shares of his company. This is not a secret. They're so proud of it, that when another newspaper started private treaties, the Times of India threatened to sue them for the trademark. <laughs> okay. So then, uh, they got, I, I get 10% of Shankar's shares, and he begins to adjust, he begins to adjust his, uh, the payment in terms of advertising space in my paper. Now, all this was going along rippingly fine until the Wall Street collapse and the collapse of all the affiliated markets around the world. When that happened, I was left holding millions of shares not worth the paper they were printed on. I was left holding junk. Now I had to keep, and yet I had to pay income tax on the revenue set for a full page of advertising because the income tax guys don't care about the value of your shares. One, uh, one page in the Times of India is worth 50 million rupees, you pay us 30% or die, whatever. So then they started yet another racket. But by the way, this blue, I'm saying that they're interlinking and interlocking into the stock exchange. I call it a structural compulsion to lie. <laughs> you can't say the economy is doing badly. You have to say everything is hunky-dory. Otherwise your shares will sink. So you have to keep heating the market. So they had, in fact the Times of India had one headline saying, economy zooms back with about 10 O's in the zoom. <laughs> okay? It 
economy, economy was screaming as it fell off a cliff actually, but <laughs> that's it. Then they moved to yet the biggest, what is today the biggest racket, I close it there, the biggest racket in India is today called, in media, is called paid news. Some of the Indians here have heard of the paid news racket. Okay. Uh, I broke the story in 2009, I'm very proud of that. When newspapers started taking gigantic sums of money to project advertising as news. And one of the biggest examples of this was Monsanto. Yeah, yeah. a full page ad in uh, Times of India, written as a story. Unfortunately, the way bureaucracy works, in one place they used it as an ad, in another place they used it as a story. And, you know, pants were down. So that's how, that's, how it, that's how it worked. But it worked devastatingly well for them in elections as political parties spent millions and millions of dollars, worth of dollars, uh, billions of rupees, millions of dollars to project their entire campaign as news. And this came to be known as paid news. I won't go into the details. You can, you can ask me about that. So you have this extremely complicated situation. Paid news is now a cancer destroying the Indian media. We have, we have not been able to find a way of taking it down. Because one of the things that's been destroyed in the last 30 years is journalists' unions and the independence of the journalists. We do not have tenured jobs now. We have 11-month contracts. I don't. I work in a newspaper that still respects the, you know, the wage board and the journalist, Working Journalists Act. But most, 90% of journalists are on 11-month contracts. So you just shut up and do what you're told. It's astonishing and refreshing that so many journalists still do not do what they do. That's great. But the prospect of that continuing, you know, as you can always bring in newer personnel, that will be over there. Hmm? So the Indian media are politically free, imprisoned by profit. We can discuss it from there. Thank you. Oh, Mimi Sharma, Asian Studies. Um, yes, Anaji, could you just talk a little bit about perhaps the, the number and variety of um, newspapers or news outlets that are not in the English-speaking urban centers, and to what extent the picture may be fractured somewhat from... Yeah. Okay, I should have us. mentioned the numbers at the beginning. Uh, See, the, the Indian language media, print in print certainly, and in television, are much larger than the English language media. But it is an illusion that they are somehow dramatically different in these issues. In some ways they are worse. And another, there is another very simple factor to this. The same guys own both. Okay. So, uh, CNN and IBM, is known for its flagship English language channel. Network 18 is known for CNN and IBM. It owns channels in 19 regional languages, which were set up by e Nadu, the biggest Telugu newspaper and publication in Andhra Pradesh. And all those have followed exactly the same line. Times of India had a once a beautiful newspaper called Navbar Times in Hindi. In the early 90s, Mr. Samir Jain, the owner of the Times of India, decreed that Navbharat Times would be no more than a translation sheet of the Times of India. So the Navbharat Times lost that zing and separateness and thing. There are still major differences in the regional languages and in the, in the, and in the English. One, there is greater debate in the Indian language press. Still reducing, but still greater. Two, there is greater diversity. Three, they are closer to the ground. They are closer to the ground because of the kind of people they write for. But the nature of corporatization is that it strives, corporatize, corporates don't look for innovation and genius. They strive for homogenization and standardization. So, you know, like India today's 
Indian language journals are just obnoxiously bad. Let me give you a wonderful example. I walked into the, you know how they, you know how they brought out their Indian language editions? The Tamil India today, the Tamil reporters in Tamil Nadu would report in Tamil. They would write their copy in Tamil and submit it to the desk in Tamil Nadu, in Chennai. The desk in Tamil Chennai would translate that into English and send it to Delhi for approval and editing. Then the edited version in English would come back and be retranslated into Tamil. Mm -hmm. Once one of the guys who was involved in this told me, you know, they've got these little head kids sitting in Delhi who impose expressions on us because they want to sound young. And I don't know what the F to do with some of these expressions when I have to... How do I translate cool chick man into Tamil? <laughs> and it sounds really hilarious in Tamil. So, I'm saying it's, it's a gigantic sausage factory in that sense that's expanding. You get them in Tamil, Hindi, Urdu, Gujarati, etc. I'm saying the differences are there still, but they are narrowing and on these basic attitudinal and political attitudinal stuff, some of the biggest and the worst media barons are from Tamil Nadu, like the Marans. But the, the, this is the last thing, because many people have got, but you know, that example again is, is kind of a, a metro middle class, it, it's very expensive to buy India today. I'm talking about, you know, really, I'm Dainik, asking you. Yeah. Dainik Jagran other... is not a metro middle class newspaper. Dainik Jagran will enter I'm deeper sorry. into the Hindi heartland than any publication you care to name. Aaj, Dainik Jagran, Dainik Baskar, these are newspapers I've published in sometimes myself. They reach into the farthest corners of the Hindi belt. Enadu reaches every village in Andhra Pradesh. Okay. Uh, Kannada Prabha reaches every district in Karnataka. These, these are not small, uh, these are not isolated exceptions. India today's impact is less than Dainik Jagran, who's, who, who can be, by the way, far more reactionary than India today, especially on issues of communalism and secularism and stuff. So it's not as a, but one point you made, which I should have wound up with, there is in the emerging in the Indian media, what I call the new convergence, non-technological convergence. This is, the new convergence is as follows. Large political families go into media. Large business families go into media. Large Political families go into business and emerge big businessmen. Large media families go into politics and become MPs and ministers like the Dardas in the cabinet and in, in parliament and, and the cabinet in Maharashtra. So you've got, this is the corporate <coughs> incest within corporate incest. This is the triangle, the fateful triangle if you like. So you've got... A, if you take Dayanidhi Maran, who was minister for IT, communication and stuff, union minister, one of the most important people in the country, for, and one of the most important portfolios, he controls about 60% of all tele, TV channel distribution in Tamil Nadu, owns major newspapers, and gets to make policy on that sector at the central government. And, and is, by the way, facing criminal charges, but it's very unlikely he will go to jail. Somebody else will take the fall. So that kind of merger has taken place between regional, national. There are always exceptions. There are exceptions within the Times of India which has, I would say, 20 fabulous reporters who still produce great stories. There are some zones of autonomy. As I said at the very beginning, you can still do things in the Indian media that you cannot do elsewhere, even in the English media. But those zones are shrinking. Those spaces are shrinking. Yeah. Yeah. Alistair, hey, Asian Studies. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, about the state of radio. Okay. Any, shall I take two, three questions? Or, yeah. What do you think the new, you talked about how these small Indian papers shook an empire. What do you think the new outlets are going to be that will shake this giant commercial empire that you have now? Okay. 
Yeah. Uh, Munisha Das with the Center for South Asian Studies. Uh, Sanit, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, your teaching in journalism and teaching students. And on Wednesday, you shared, uh, you know, uh, students' work, uh, your students' work, who are now in journalism, various kinds of journalism. And uh, I'm sure you present the same analysis to them. So where do they find pockets to do their work? They're trained to be guerrilla journalists. When they burn down one forest, you run to the next. <laughs> um, radio is still largely, largely in the state sphere. However, in the name of freeing the radio waves, what they've really done is to give license to the same sus usual suspects from the mainstream media. So midday will have the biggest FM station, Times of India will have Radio Mirchi, Hindustan Times will have something else, someone else will have FM 93.7. And it's the same gang doing the same crap job on radio. <coughs> In theory, it can also be freed up for communities and co-ops, but it's extremely difficult to actually launch one of those community radio stations. It's extremely difficult to launch. Whereas, what they, so they haven't freed the radio waves, they have leased radio waves. The state is leasing them to these companies. It still remains, in many ways, the most ubiquitous of media, because you'll find it in places where you won't find anything else. Somebody with batteries has a radio set in a village in Mizoram, you can hear the radio. So that, there it remains. The potential is unquestionable. The product is, again, even within state media, I find that, say, local stations in Kerala, or local stations in some one local innovative guy in Odisha in one district. They do very interesting programs locally within that framework, but it's the, it's just the thin end of the wedge. There's something totally different behind it. Still has tens of millions of audience. In the cities now, the private FM guys have virtually drowned out everything else. Yeah. And uh, your question was about and what do you think the new equivalent of these, these smaller Indian papers that sort of shook the empire? What do you think will shake? I think, I think see, one, one is this, that I, I've said, um, while you have an alternative media, the history of the Indian media is such that the mainstream itself gives you a certain kind of space. I am not willing to see my space in the mainstream. I insist on being a nuisance in the mainstream. Okay? And, I, and, and that's why, by the way, I keep training journalists to go into the mainstream. I know that the alternative media in India, what you call alternative, will pick my stuff up anyway. Mm -hmm. And they, are, they, are, they have full freedom to use it free without payment because I, I allow anyone to reproduce anything of mine. It, so long as it's not a commercially owned newspaper, commercially run newspaper, and, okay? Even that I don't mind because most newspapers in India, the smaller towns, don't have that much money. So the Odia newspapers, the small Telugu newspapers reproduce me freely. I, I, I've made some great progress in the last 20 years. When I started out as a rural reporter, they used to lift the entire article, plagiarize it and put it under someone else's name. <laughs> now they put it under my name. <laughs> so I, I, I'm okay with that. You know? yeah? so we make progress. Uh, so my point is, I want to fight to change the mainstream itself. I want to create the kind of mainstream space that we had. How do we do that? There, I, there are very concrete things. First, all problems, just like, you know, the, the problems within the education sector, can they be solved entirely within the education sector? No, they can't. There are much larger things which you have to attend to. You're going to have to fight battles in your local legislature. You're going to fight battles in Congress and Senate, correct? Same with media. All the problems of the media are much larger than and do not necessarily originate from within the media sector. They originate from the corporate sector. They originate from a number of other places. They originate from the political sector, from the political domain. So you've got to be able to fight those battles on many fronts. Number one, there is no escape from fighting and curbing monopolies and corporatization. So the fight for renewal of media is necessarily a battle against corporate power and inevitably a battle against monopoly. 
It's not for nothing that Bekdekian's book, he never changed the title in all the editions, The Media Monopoly. Worldwide, there are far worse monopolies in media today than there have ever been, except that we think they're so friendly and we don't recognize Google and Twitter and Facebook. Do you know the extent of monopoly of these guys? Google alone accounts for 41% of all revenue on the net. One company. That has never happened in the history of print media or film or anywhere else that one company toted up 41%. Google, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Yahoo, and uh, AOL. AOL account for two-thirds of all advertising revenue on the net. And there's one gigantic difference okay, between the digital mob and the other thugs. The big difference between these monopolies and all other monopolies are that these guys own your personal data. And they sell it and they trade in it and they thrive off it. That no other monopolies have had that privilege of owning your data. Okay? And all of them, when asked to bend, they crawl for the NSA. Google in its office and had a splitter, just like you use on your router between the telephone and the computer. They allowed the NSA to put in splitters so that the entire traffic could go to the NSA. Actually, one of the posters, my friend Roy Singham, who's the founder of ThoughtWorks, one of the most progressive open source software companies in the world, he showed me a lovely poster, Obama's campaign slogan, Yes, we scan. <laughs> yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. As you're talking about me. Sorry, I just, yeah. so I'm saying one is to destroy monopolies, two is to, I mean, is to curb monopoly, keep corporations out of the media. In history, there were two Indian, there were two press commissions in India, not press council, press commissions. Both of them said the greatest threat to press freedom came from increasing ownership of the media by business houses. Who were these guys? These were not left-wing radicals. These were former Supreme Court judges. These were conservatives who, in studying the media in the press commission, said that this is going out of hand. We have to find some way of stopping the commercialization of the press. So we have very good precedents to make our demands on. And then there is a Working Journalist Act in India, which means that the entire contract system of hire and fire is actually illegal, and we ought to be fighting that. But they using the contract system, they destroyed the journalist unions. Because you can't be a union, if you are in the 8th month of your 11 month contract, and I tell you, listen, you want your contract to be renewed, get out of the union. You will. Okay, if you've got two kids in school and what not. So the restoration of journalist unions, the enforcement of the Working Journalist Act, which is the law of the land, the curbing of monopolies, and lastly and most important is public action. Whenever anyone asks me what you can do, I always say this. If you are not supporting three alternative experiments in journalism and media, don't crib to me, I don't want to hear you. Okay, are you subscribing to at least two, three radical alternative outfits to a counter punch or to a nation of change or whoever, your choice. If you are not putting your money where your mouth is, but you want a belly, belly ache about the mainstream media, I have no time for the complaint. You've got to be supporting those. There are, in India, lots of little journals that do incredibly good work and which are very important, like e Economic and Political Weekly. It's got a circulation of 11,000 or 12,000, but what a role it plays. One of the, again, one of the things that favors us in India is the history of moral authority in journalism. Our journalists were Gandhi, Ambedkar, and that sort. People... The moral authority, they could have journals of small circulation and gigantic impact. We can do that and we can, we can use the laws of the existing laws of the journal, Working Journalists Act. We can curb monopolies, we can fight off corporations and we can defend journalistic independence also by having strong movements of journalists. But it has to happen that the public also participate, take ownership of the media in that sense and demand the changes in it. Yeah. This is about the internationalization of the media and the monopolies there. Uh, China has got alternatives to Google, to eBay, to all of these things. Where do you see that playing itself out in the next years? 
See, I think some years from now it will be important. The trouble is I don't know and none of us knows very much about the internal dynamics of the things. But some, someone like Roy Singham, who is, from, who is from the United States and heads ThoughtWorks, ThoughtWorks is the channel that, ThoughtWorks is the company that hosts the Guardian, UK Guardian website, many top clients like that. They all say that one of the advantages that India has, like when the Snowden revelations came out, you know, look at the difference between the crawling of, it irritates me, the Brazilian president cancels her trip to the United States. Our poodle goes and scratches at the doors of the White House for entry. <laughs> and India was a much bigger target than Brazil. They collected 13 billion pieces of information in three months from the country. Yeah. And yet, we just kept quiet. One, what the what top software, free software guys and others who are concerned with digital independence say? They say, look, you, you do have some of the top IT talent in the world. First thing, get your damn servers out of the United States. Locate your data on your own servers, on your own soil. Which means that the Indian government will be in a better position to snoop, yes. <laughs> but you've got, the, you've got the talent to work out methods of making that. And at the same time, you've got, today one of the good things, you've got a growing free software movement in India. With very radical people, very uncompromisingly, you know, for digital freedom people leading it like Kwai Kiran Chandra or Prabir Purkai, so many of such people, but it's really excellent. They're small, but they're very active, and they can be terrifically, tremendously effective. So that's the way to go, that you use your skills and talents to start looking for alternatives. We can, by the way, reduce the amount of US snooping. That already. Our, our embassies and all, all your mission in UN is completely, completely snooped on. We haven't made the single slightest change after the revelations to do it. You want, when you've got a bunch of guys who, who think American, you've got a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry? You yeah, uh, my name is Doug Matsuoka. I'm with a group called Hawaii Guerrilla Video Hui, um, or cooperative. I didn't answer the <laughs> question. Sorry, I, you reminded me I will. Uh. Um, and uh, you mentioned uh, the year 1893, which is significant here in Hawaii. We have a daily paper called the Star Advertiser. Mm, it was I've called the Honolulu Advertiser, the Pacific Advertiser. And the original publisher, Lauren Thurston, was the one who um, mounted an armed overthrow of the Hawaiian nation in 1893. And that paper continues, the Star Advertiser. We also have uh, the Civil Beat, which is owned by a billionaire. And now Huffington Post Hawaii is owned by a Millionaire and uh, America Online. So those are our basic sources of information. Hawaii is kind of unique as far as the information it produces, the information that we need to make decisions. It's How, entirely controlled by someone outside. And some outside big guys. What do we do? That Give is us the fate of several, several smaller states in the country. That is so. Look. In a sense, you know, our, our problem in some senses is slightly more perplexing in that we have our own guys, yeah, who are not being coerced into doing anything, but doing it willingly. That makes it, in some, to my mind, somewhat more difficult and complex. When they think that way, shared values, when their minds are locked into that kind of situation. But what you can do is absolutely pretty much the same. You have to, one, you have, you can't say, I will do only alternative media. You do not have that luxury. You have to somehow force your way into the mainstream media as well. You have to do that through public action. You have to do that so that if something, something really crappy happens in that newspaper, you got to see that they get 6,000 letters on it of protest from your, from readers. You got to see that readers, delegations go there and talk to the newspaper and say, that this is unacceptable what you've done. But the history of that news, newspaper owners, it's essentially choosing your favorite billionaire. That's, yeah. that's who these guys are. A.J. Liebling wrote that in 1947, voting your favorite millionaire. And in a, in a book on the press called The Wayward Pressman. 
So that is not a struggle you can escape. There is no techno fix for it. There is a political struggle fix for it. Okay? It's again, you're, what, are you, what are you talking about? You're talking about fighting monopolies. And except that foreign monopolies. So I think that if you replace it with a Hawaiian monopoly, your victory is very limited. It's, it's victory, but it's still very limited. If you replace it with something which ensures diversity of voices, you got something. And, and sorry, sorry, Manisha, I forgot your question. I find that, I, I find that the young, and I've taught journalism in Iowa, Berkeley, I, I ran a course in uh, Princeton last year, though it doesn't have a journalism school, it was a journalism course called Reporting Inequality. The one in Trinity, the, the top brass asked me to change the titles <laughs> because my title, it, finally the title we went with was uh, The Zen of McDonald's. It was about, my original title was Corporations Are Gonna Get Your Mama. <laughs> <laughs> because that's the biggest brand in advertising, right? And when it's not mama, it's grandma. So that was the original title. Uh, I find wherever I go, pe young people, especially young people who come to journalism, are essentially idealistic. Mm -hmm. They could make much more money by going into advertising. They could make much more money by going into other... The journalism is the low-end, low-wage place in, 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 the, in media. Okay. And that is... Why do I go back and teach for 27 years? I think it's very important because I think the response... When I look at the journalists of, who walked out of that school and what they're doing, I feel extremely chuffed about it. I mean, they're doing fantastic stuff. Okay. Mr. Samir Jain once famously said, a journalist... Journalism is a business like any other business. Journalist, an editor ought to be able to serve chai if required. Okay. He's different. He was wrong on several counts. One, Journalism is not a product like any other product. You can sell the same toothpaste for six months. You can't sell the same newspaper tomorrow. Okay, so that, that itself is the first fundamental flaw in that argument. Second, if you look at the history of our journalism, and who were the journalists of India? And in much of the third world for that matter. Much of the third world. If you look at it, then newspapers may be a business. Channels are a business. Multimedia, mega Conglomerates are a business. Journalism is a calling. It's not a business. And Ambedkar was a journalist. And Gandhi was a journalist. Long before he was a Mahatma, he was a journalist. Okay. All over, there were other famous journalists from Europe who were journalists. We know them as other things, but they were journalists. They earned their living from it. Okay. So, I think that's a calling. And I find that the young everywhere who come, have that thing that they could have gone somewhere else but they opted for journalism because they, they want to connect with their society, they want to change something, they feel strongly and passionately about something. That is to be encouraged, not to be drawn on. Right? So, after that, how you evolve yourself, how you adjust to the evolving situation and climate around you, that's on your ingenuity. I call it guerrilla journalism. I don't think that we are exploiting even the existing spaces, zones of autonomy within the media. Even the existing spaces, we don't exploit it enough. I believe today there are basically two kinds of journalism. There's journalism and there's stenography. <laughs> Most of what we call journalism is essentially stenography to the power. To power. Stenogra stenography, we are stenographers to the power. So I would... My thing is to try and train them as journalists, not stenographers. Mm -hmm. yeah. As Shankar in Mr. Partners. So, Sainath, I mean, the, the picture you're drawing in India is obviously quite similar to something that we're all familiar with, which is a Rupert Murdoch phenomenon. So, one, um, Rupert Murdoch is doing it on a transnational, global, international he's, scale. He's, he's collapsed, though, you know. He's yes. a big, so I, that's bad what I, trouble. Yeah. I know. So, I just wanted you to comment on the Rupert Murdoch phenomenon. You know, the, the one thing, the extraordinary thing about Rupert Murdoch and corporatization, it really gives you fantastic ideas how he came to the United States. Do you know he's changed his citizenship twice? 
first he he was from australia right and uh, he bought a newspaper in britain the much beloved sun and what he did was he first gained control of those papers through shares and other means and then uh, to to own those papers he took british citizenship once he took british citizenship he then worked tremendously on the governments to change the laws relating to media and by the way he has managed to do that to some sort of good extent in india also then in china too in china well he then took american citizenship in order to be able to start his fourth network arriving in the united states he, he bought a studio first he was pleased which he was pleased to find named after himself 20th century fox <laughs> <laughs> so then uh, and he started with that then he ch changes his citizenship and gets the laws changed for many things in the united states which enable the growth of his fourth network and by the way about china i, be I believe his the, the last wife is chinese <coughs> maybe we're looking at a new citizenship i don't know but he has always done this he has got into a country suborn the local laws and institutions lobbied for change bought out local newspapers almost do you know that there is virtually no newspaper that murdoch has started that turned a profit all were acquisitions the only paper that he founded that is today profitable is the australian it took 25 years for it to turn a profit so it's not as if this guy established anything great in journalism he bought titles he bought the south china morning post then resold it he bought a number look at what he look at what happened to the times london one time quality paper in the british eye what did he do with it he threw out the greatest editors of the time yeah. so again it's about monopoly and corporate power and the political influence peddling murdoch has brought down governments he brought down bob hawks government in in australia he brought down bob hawks government okay yeah. and he enabled and did the drum beating for margaret margaret thatcher's victory when she was really down and out and he did the jingoistic beats for the falkland war okay all of that murdoch plays a very very important role in world politics again within corporations media have a special power that other corporations don't which is why in the last 20 years all corporations have sought to acquire a media arm so he entered india through star tv a refurbished american military satellite which went bust over hong kong hutchinson vampoa bought and refurbished the star that was satellite television asian region that's what star stands for from hutchinson vampoa he bought it over refurbished it beamed initially for 2 years millions of liquor ads into a country where liquor advertising is banned and if you look at the beautiful part of it he was banning liquor ads into india where we don't have liquor ads and he was doing so from hong kong where liquor is all liquor ads are also banned we are talking about a gigantic corporation mr new mr rupert murdoch managed to be at the same time but there are six corporations in the world that more or less dominate most of the world's media mr murdoch managed to be the biggest publisher of raunchy media like like page 3 of the sun and other semi porn stuff and at the same time was the largest publisher of evangelical literature in the world so i think that's that's, that's diversity <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah so I, i'm saying that murdoch inaugurates the era of the mega corp in media Yeah, Ashok Das, uh, Urban and Regional Planning. Uh, yeah. Sorry, can I have some of this? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, thanks. This was fine. Wanted you to comment on how, since you started in journalism, the role of women and journalism education have changed. Okay. Uh, there are astonishingly far more women today in Indian media. Now, the, the, I, and and it has changed the face of indian media it's also changed the quality very considerably 
So far, I teach in two schools in India regularly, and one of lectures in many other schools. One of them is a co ed. I mean, the, when you have both women and men in Asian College of Journalism in Chennai. The other, which I've taught at for 27 years, is Sophia Polytechnic, which only this year for the first time took in four guys. Otherwise, it's an, all, it's an endowment school, all women's school. There is no question in my mind after 27 years that they make, they make better interviewers. Better. You know, they make, on the whole, they make better reporters and journalists, and they make better interviewers, for sure. How did they come into the media in a big way itself is very funny. It happened by accident, and I was personally involved at a, at a peripheral level. United News of India and Press Trust of India, the two biggest news agencies, never hired a woman in their life. And in 1980, Appan Menon, who was one of the founders of NDTV and was in the UNI, came to the campus and told me that, okay, now stop faffing around and it's about time you started pretending to work. Because till then we were not even pretending. Then, so he, we went and wrote the entrance exam for, uh, now what happened, we, we sent out, they sent us, we, we sent in essays and stuff and then they called us for an exam. My colleague was a girl called, in, in the, in the uh, JNU, there was a girl by the name Ritambara Shastri. Very important to know this name. Her name, when, when written as I write my name, P. Sainath, I don't write Palagumi Sainath, I write P. Sainath, she wrote R. Shastri. And you and I called her for the test thinking she was a man. R. Shastri. Sounds very male. So when we went there, that guy's eyes were popping out. Ritambra is very female. And you know, he, they didn't know. They were all standing there gaping. Now they, after having called her for the exam, they couldn't refuse to let her take the exam. But they were appalled that a woman had stepped onto the sacred soil of the United News of India, which was meant for distilleries and fights in the backyard. Okay. So, <laughs> now it so happened that Archie, well that's her nickname, Archie and I topped that exam. And then, then they had to take. They, then they, they went through great agonies in the big main central desk of UNI, how to seat this very pretty young woman over there. Now I don't know, and she doesn't know either, whether the measures they took were to protect her from the guys or the guys from her, according to their mindset. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it was. But they took her off to another room, uh, which was called the Gulf News Service, and which was run, run by somebody who was about 112 years old and considered safe with young <laughs> women. <laughs> but in six months' time, Archie had proved that she was simply fantastic at her work. Then they started consciously recruiting from IIMC. Two more girls came in. Today I am very pleased to tell you that that same Ritambara Shastri is the first ever woman chief editor of a news agency in India, the same United News of India. She is the chief news editor. of First woman of a, to head any news agency in India. But so once a few came in and made an impact that transformed everything. Meanwhile, the Marwadis who owned uh, Times of India began to realize that there was good mon monetary value in women. Because if you had a woman reporter, you didn't have to get the pewns to carry her in from the press club at deadline time. Because the guys were all drunk. Okay, so, so at least the woman reporter, and by the nature, being a woman reporter, you had to perform twice as well to stand in the same place. Right? You were always proving yourself. So one day the Times of India woke up to the fact that they got terrific value for their money from this. So they, today the bulk of Times of India's reporters in many spheres, it started by giving them trivial beats. Today some of Delhi's top political correspondents are there. But there's, that's the nice side of it. On the unnice side of it, like if you go to Berkeley or you go to, and even in parts of India, 
I found that 85% of the students were women in journalism schools, not for the best reason, because that's the low end of the journalism profession, low wage, that's, who, that's who's going to fill the ranks. Because guys who have a third after their name, they have frat backgrounds and can become editors of Harper's Bazaar or whatever it is without doing a journalism degree. Right? So more and more women are coming in because journalists, the real wages of journalists in the United States, I don't believe they've gone up 10 cents in the last half many years, in real wages. So you have, uh, and so men are migrating out of those posts and looking for other stuff. Where, so, all, all your journalism schools today are dominated by women, which from my point of view for, is a very good thing for the profession, but the reasons it's happening are not so nice. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the thing. But still, even now, however good they are, they hit a glass ceiling fairly soon when it comes to editorship and leadership positions. If there are five people, all other things equal, they take the mail. Yeah. So I just wanted to add to that, because uh, between 83 and 89, I worked for the Telegraph on the news desk. And, uh, you know, we were a young crop of very idealistic people. We hadn't gone to journalism school, but we were being recruited very aggressively. Uh, for, you know, we were paid a thousand rupees per month uh, for our internship for the first... Not bad in 83. Mm -hmm. I was uh, earning less than a full-time employee. So <laughs> 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 don't cry. <laughs> okay, I won't cry about that, but I have to say that the field was extremely sexist. Um, and you know it Welcome was very, the very, media. very, very hard to survive as a woman, and you had to act like a man, you know, sort of live up to these standards, you know, go drink with them in order to establish yourself as anybody worthwhile. And we never, you know, were not encouraged to move from the desk to reporting, for yeah. example, yeah. or given very, very trivial assignments. So I hope that that environment has changed. Yes and no. I mean, you will find far more women in the Telegraph who are reporters today than in your time. Far more. And you'll probably find in the edition coming out of Delhi or somewhere, it would be 80% women. Okay? You'll find all that. But the social attitudes, um, say, media at least, because you've had 20 years now to create a, an atmosphere or a milieu. The vicious attitudes towards women are very much there, far worse in television, far far greater levels of harassment and stuff, because television hasn't developed some kind of code or rules over 200 years or 20 years or 30 years. It's new in that sense, mass TV. So there's really, really uh, women reporters in TV can have a bad time. You know? Maybe not in the anglicized elite spots of Delhi and Mumbai, but even there they do. But in some of the other places, it, it is really bad. That is also, that is not just the attitude embedded in your media, that's your society. So that, it's probably less than when you look at it, but it also opens up more in television now than it did earlier. It's there. The, the fact is that those women have been able to make those advances despite that. And that's just I just want to make a comment actually on this one related. Uh, so one of my very good friends from high school, so I went to Shillong uh, for my high school. So she uh, joined, uh, she studied at the Delhi College of Arts and Commerce and then her first, one of her first jobs was working as a research assistant for Karan Thapar where he used to have that Wednesday night, some hour long mm -hmm. interview thing. I forgot what it was called, one on one sort of thing. So, Somewhere in his fine, in the fine print, her name used to appear. I remember, you know, but it was mostly Karan Sapar who popped the limelight. Anyway, so then she became one of the first correspondents on Aaj Tak, when Aaj Tak still had some semblance of reason, you know. I mean, that's that, in, in that's the, a hard place in the very beginning. And she was, and she was, she could do both English and Hindi. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. news reading. Mm -hmm. And then she changed, she left Ashta once it started doing, then went to IB and I think then Channel 7 and finally she was given up and she's doing some organic farming in Goa <laughs> because she said that try as hard as she wanted, she could never influence news content for example. You know, and, I mean, that was never given to any woman, I mean even though she was one of the most senior correspondents, she never... Actually you do have... In television, I mean that's no, But even in television you do have women who've made it there. Mm -hmm. But I can, I mean I... 
I can fully, I can fully identify with. I don't know about going into organic farming. But <laughs> probably she felt she had dealt with a lot of manure in the It's possible. Yeah. Yeah. But say the Hindu. I, I'm the resident editor of the Hindu in Mumbai. All except one member of the bureau are women, and the bureau chief is a woman. Slightly nepotistic things about it, but in the in the sense that almost all of them were my students either 19 years ago or 17 years ago. But then, if you are in Mumbai or in Chennai, it was the likelihood that you would have been my student. Well, thank you very much, everybody, but especially our honoured guest, Miss Naina, for a wonderful.